Let us stand, please. Three verses of Scripture found in Galatians. Two of them in chapter 1. The other in chapter 5. This is the first letter the Apostle Paul will write. And he writes it to the churches he established in his first missionary journey. There were four of them. Antioch of Pisidia, Icodium, Lystria, and Derbe. Notice, please, in the salutation in verse 4, he speaks of Jesus Christ, who, Lord Jesus Christ, gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. In chapter 2, verse 4, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. Chapter 5, verse 1. Stand therefore, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The Lord bless His word. You may be seated. Uh, this letter that Apostle Paul writes to those churches has been considered to be a magna charter of our spiritual emancipation. It is, indicates our liberty and freedom from Christ. Martin Luther, the reformer, our Protestant reformer, uh, used this as a benchmark for his preaching of the justification by faith. Because the do a doctrine of justification is mentioned in this letter, it becomes some be the primary theme and the focus. And rightly so, Martin Luther will use it because it speaks of our liberty and how that we are free. And uh, he emphasizes the, major, uh, the minor, uh, minor point in it in regards to justification uh, in Christ Jesus. There's a situation that's taken place in the churches that Paul has established. There are some Judaizers going around telling them that Gentiles have to be circumcised. The issue concerning the letter is, are Gentiles, can they be included in the family of God without Jewish identifying marks? The whole issue is Gentile inclusion. Jews, rightly so, consider themselves to be the family of God and the children of the Lord. Something's taken place. The Messiah has come. He's died for our sins. He's raised, ascended to the right hand of the Father. And these Jews have begun preaching everywhere that men can come to know the Lord. First they preached it to the Jews, as you well know, in Acts in Jerusalem. And only spoke to that of Jews. And then, of course, it would spread over through the ministry of Philip to the Sumerians. And there, well, they're half Jews. And... Uh, they receive the word of the Lord in a goodly manner. Persecution comes to the early church, and then through that persecution, it's because of the persecution that came with Saul, and the church will spread after that persecution all the way to Damascus. And the Apostle Paul tells us that uh, the uh, importance of that is uh, Gentiles are getting saved. And they sent a man up there called Barnabas to check it out. And when Barnabas comes, he finds out that Gentiles have indeed received the word of the Lord and they're not being circumcised. What does he do? He does not go back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles what the situation is. He goes all the way over to Antioch to get this man Saul who's been converted. And he's been away for about ten years. And... Uh, He's been preaching and around in that area, and we have no um, uh, record of his ministry there. But Barnabas goes get Saul, and for one whole year, they teach the Word of God in Antioch. There's five leaders there in that early church, and 
You'll find them ministering to the Lord in Acts chapter 13. And then the Spirit will separate Barnabas and Saul for the work they've done. And now the first missionary team has been uh, sent off or commissioned by the, uh, by the Spirit. So they choose a young man called Mark to go with them. And Barnabas and Saul and Mark will uh, be the first missionary sent off to do some work. And they primarily will go to various places where synagogues have been established. And Paul, because he's a rabbi and a Pharisee, will have entrance. And he uses this to reach them. Which during this time, he establishes these churches. But nowhere does he ever require Gentiles to be circumcised. This becomes a problem. A real problem to some of the uh, people in Jerusalem who are stickers to following the Mosaic law particularly concerning circumcision, because this is an entrance into the family of God. Even Gentiles who are willing to be a part of the Jewish nation in faith have to be circumcised. So we can't allow these men who've received Christ not to be circumcised. It's such an issue that Paul sends off this letter and tells them that of their freedom. You have de de delivered, if you will notice, have been delivered from this present evil world. The emphasis upon their freedom in Christ. And these verses indicate his purpose. First, in reference to you have been delivered from this present evil world. He doesn't make any comment concerning any prayer or any thanksgiving. He goes straight to it and says, I marvel that you've been so removed so quickly from the gospel that has been preached to you. If anybody else comes to you or an angel comes to you and they preach anything other than what I preach to you, you consider them cursed. And if I come and preach to you something other than what I've already preached, consider me cursed. Why? Because there is a gospel. He preached that gospel. And that gospel is that we're, we are free. We've been free from the world and the bondage of the world and we're not to be set in liberty. Now, let's note the problem because he mentions the problem in verse 4 of chapter 2 because false brethren have come in a wires privately despite your liberty in Christ. They do not like the freedom that you have in Christ and they wish to bind you with that which they themselves have not been able to live by. And then, of course, uh, he shares with them this value and the importance of it. This is a, this letter is a, is a bombshell. Because now, because of it, there will be a, 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 a convention, a conference, the first assembly of the church, the elders in the various churches. Elders from each one of these churches have been appointed. Elders of the church in Antioch and the elders in the church in Jerusalem with the apostles will gather themselves together because this needs to be addressed. Can Gentiles be included in the family of God without circumcision? So, having written the letter before the council in Acts 15, Paul will give, a, and they come, Paul will talk about the work that they've done and the enjoyment of all the things they've been doing. Some place the writing of this a little uh, after the council. Uh, it wouldn't fit some way, but not the arguments right now. Uh, but he sends, uh, they, they get together, and after much discussion, Peter gets up and says, I want you to know that this gospel was first given to me to preach to the Gentiles. And I went down to Cornelius' house. And I, I preached there. And we, you know Gentiles don't do, uh, Jews don't enter Gentile homes. But I went in there. We didn't need. I brought some brothers with me. And they come in there and I just preached the gospel to them. I didn't come to sit and eat. I preached the gospel to them. And when I preached the gospel, something happened. All of a sudden... Uh, the Holy Ghost fell on them. They began speaking tongues like we did. What forbid me to baptize them? And I baptized them. Brother, I want you to know the first Gentiles that got saved without being circumcised was through my ministry. Now, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, though Peter doesn't say that in John and Acts 15. And having made that statement and heard the case from uh, Barnabas and Paul concerning what God's done to them, the moderator of that meeting was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, which happened to be at the time the brother of Jesus, James. And James will get up and say, It seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us that we lay on them no burden, that we couldn't even bear ourselves. 
other than these particular things. And there were things that they were new. No fornication, no eating blood, no, nothing offered to idols, nothing strangled in blood. So these were the stipulations that was required. But other than that, you don't have to obey the ceremonial law of Moses. Well, it was... Uh, if, it, if they had turned any other way, Christianity would have never become a world religion as it is now. It would have been stuck in Judaism. But God understood this and reached it. Now Paul will defend it because when he writes to that, he talks about it. Notice how he explained this liberty we have in him. But uh, in this letter, he tells us first that this liberty is provided. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, he declared that the, uh, this, uh, this salvation has been provided to us, or, or liberty rather, has been provided for us through Christ. And then, of course, the second aspect, he will defend it. Then thirdly, he will explain what he talks about, makes application, and then gives encouragement. So that's the way the letter is divided. First, a, a provision. We have been delivered from this present evil world through the gospel of Christ Jesus. Let no man take away the liberty we have received. Amen. And this gospel, he says, he's going to defend it. And he defends it in three ways. Number one, I've received this by revelation from Christ. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 11, I certify you, brethren, the gospel which was preached to me is not of men. Neither I received it of men. I received it by revelation of Christ. Those three years in which I was in Arabia, the Word of God spoke to me. Wouldn't you like to have been there? After three years, he will begin to look at the Word of God in the new sins. Reads the Old Testament's over, but now with the viewpoint of seeing Christ Jesus. And in it, the eyes have been opened, and he reads the Word of God, and he sees Jesus on every page. If you want to really know a hermeneutics, that is the study of Scripture and the view of it, the first thing you need to do about this Bible is that the Bible speaks about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. Now we can preach the Old Testament, we can preach the New Testament, we can talk about this character and that character and glean some proofs from them, but we are far from what the early church did in preaching the Old Testament. When they preached about it, they showed conclusively that Jesus Christ was, was there. We preach about Joseph, but we don't sometimes emphasize that Joseph was a type of the Lord. We, we, we forget all of those things and we, and we grab this and that, but the Old Testament was just simply a thing about Jesus. Jesus. That's what he tells us on the way to Emmaus. There were two of them, Cleopas and probably his wife. They're all back, going back toward uh, uh, Emmaus, and they've heard, you know, that Jesus has been raised, but they, they, they've not done it. They, and, and Jesus appears to them and speaks to them, and he says he opened their understanding and revealed himself in, in, in the Psalms, in the Law, and the Prophets. Wouldn't you like to have heard Jesus' discourse on himself as he revealed from them? Their hearts did burn within them as he turned to each one of those Old Testament books and said, here he is, here he is, here he is. They, they did that. Matter of fact, Paul mentions writing to the church at Corinth. He said there was a time that they were baptized under Moses as they walked. But uh, that rock was Christ. That bread that came from heaven was the Lord. It all typified as they were baptized under Moses. We're baptized under Christ. Everything pointed to Jesus. It would be a good thing for us to reread the Old Testament and see Jesus Christ found in it all. Oftentimes, all we will is get just a little story here and there and some character bits about this to help us. Well, it's not just topics that we need to see. We need to see Him. He does the same thing, and we'll mention it in this letter. This is the gospel. It's the gospel of Christ Jesus, and He's come to deliver us. I received this revelation from Him. No man taught it to me. It was not confirmed uh, uh, by others are teaching to me, but I, I received it from Him. And I preached that very Word. Now, Acts tells us that when Paul got saved, he immediately preached that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And he did. But there, knowing his inadequacy of what he needed, he left and went away for a while. And then will come back. And then when he comes back, the early church hears about it. He comes to Jerusalem. And what they do, they tell him that the whoop has become a lamb. The guy that persecuted is not here. And now persecution starts again. And the apostle said, glad you got saved. That's wonderful. Would you please leave? That's right. They weren't ready. Barnabas, even they were kind of skeptical. Barnabas was the one that would introduce them. And they say, I'm so glad that you've gotten saved. That's good. Why don't you go home? and preach the gospel over there. 
Uh, you're going to bring persecution to us again. They're, they're, they'll, they'll be out to kill you. And they said, okay, I'll go. And he was over there and, and he stays over there for about seven years. And then Barnabas goes and gets him and brings him back to Antioch. But in this letter he will proclaim that I have received this by revelation. It wasn't given to me by any apostle, nor man, nor flesh and blood had revealed it to me. I met Jesus in the Scriptures as, I, uh, as was unfolded to me in that uh, time of sabbatical leave as it was. And I found Him to be real. And then he says, he confirms it. He says, uh, now that which I preached... Uh, I came down among the disciples with one uh, uh, Titus, and they didn't require him to be a, uh, who was a Greek to be circumcised. And matter of fact, they didn't want to add anything to what I preached. They didn't tell me that I needed to preach anything else. He said, I went down there to make sure that what I was doing was preaching right. Notice, he was sitting, knowing that the Lord had given him the message that he preached, he still submitted himself to the authority of the apostles. And what does he do? They added nothing to me, but they, they gave me the right hand of fellowship. That means that they, they acknowledged him as an apostle. They didn't give him church membership. Oh, he's already part of the church. They gave him right hand of fellowship, shook the hand of Barnabas and Paul, and they separated the ministry of service. Peter would become the primary leader of the work toward the Jews, and Paul would become the primary leader of the church uh, to the Gentiles. Remember, he'll write a little later on all the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility of the church or the burden of all the churches had been laid upon him. Here it is. They give him that responsibility. Your responsibility is to lead the work that will, uh, to the churches, the Gentile churches, while Paul, Peter will take on the responsibility of ministering to the Jews. At the time, my friend, at the time there were more churches in the Jewish world than there were in the Gentile world. And at the time, the only Gentile churches they had were the churches that the Apostle Paul established. At this time, there's about four of them. A little later on, there will be others, and the church will grow. This Apostle to the Gentile will reach his world, and it reaches down to where we are. So they, they give it to him, said, remember the poor, and they said, we've always done that. They didn't add anything, but they confirmed that what I was preaching was correct. And then invitation after this visit is given to Peter. Why don't you come up and visit us? And Peter comes up and visits them. And this meeting is, is before the council in Jerusalem because if it was, there wouldn't have been that kind of division. Uh, but anyway, they, uh, they, 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 uh, Peter comes up, sits down at the tables, and what does he do? Just winds up there, he eats the pork and things like that, and, 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 and being at liberty. And then all of a sudden, some fellows coming from James comes over and says, Hello, uh, uh, you're our apostle to the Jews and uh, uh, we can't eat like this. You're going to have to come over here and eat with us. Well, uh, Peter says, Bye-bye. I'm going to go over here and be with my brothers because, you know, I, I, I'm their apostle as it was and I, I, I got responsibility to them. Separate even so, so much that Barnabas is led away by the hypocrisy. Uh, at the time, Paul's not there, but when he comes in, he sings the division. Over here's doom and gloom. There's not that kind of spontaneous joy among the Gentiles as it before. And you got the brothers from the Jews over on this side. And it seemed like a heavy cloud has come upon them. And then he will maintain his gospel by rebuking Peter. And in the rebuke, he, he mentioned to him, you are to blame. And then he says, we and I. It's a lesson of how we are to rebuke people. Uh, and comes down when he says, you know, I am a, a transgressor. He didn't say, and Peter, you are a transgressor. If I be a transgressor, he, he brings the rebuke to himself. But in that, Paul maintained truth. He said, I want you to know this gospel that was given to me, I received it by God. The apostles themselves confirmed it. And when Peter came, and it seemed to me he'd led away from the liberty that we had, I rebuked him to the face, but I withstood him because he was to blame. Sometimes if we may lead in one direction, it may be a small deviation, but it will lead us in the wrong direction. And Paul would not allow Peter uh, this opportunity to uh, break in just even a small thing like eating with the Jews separate from the Gentiles. I don't know what happened, but in my mind's eye, I can see all of this. Peter probably looked over.
over to them and was a little angry because they had hoodwinked him, you know. Uh, Peter's always had this little problem about the, uh, 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 the appraisal of others and it's, it's got to him. He probably looked at him and says, I'm going over there. You can stay here if you want to, but we better get over there. I don't know whether they immediately left or not, but they got kind of angry with this. And, and the council will come about trying to settle this issue, and it will be settled. Well, they'll still go on. Even the others will reject the council of the church, uh, uh, but it's settled. Liberty in Christ is provided for us. And that those of us who would like to take away, or those who would like to take away our liberty in Christ, cannot do so because it's established by the gospel itself. Now, this this liberty, of course, is mentioned in three ways about uh, we are free from the the evil of this world. The present evil of this world is seen in, in, in greed and vainglory. It is seen in the indulgence of the flesh. It is seen in our identifying with the world that is around us. But also it's identified in uh, the performance, uh, performance-based religion. That's what these Jews had. We call them legalists. You know, and people look at us and say that we're legalists. But here they were. What they were doing is that they were taking their religion and saying that there are certain things that you've got to do in order to be right and acceptable to God. A, 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 a base, a, a performance-based religion. And we today have the same problem. Uh, there are those who be, become saved in the Lord. They've experienced their liberty as they do. And what happens is that they turn their liberty to a duty and their religion becomes something that they perform hoping that their religion will satisfy their God. And Paul will tell us, explaining, not only defending it, but explaining it. Number one in chapter three, first thing he says, it comes by faith, not by works. Did you receive the Spirit by works or by faith? Did the miracles come to you? Did they come to you by works or by faith? Were you justified by works or by faith? In other words, he speaks to the whole uh, uh, realm of our Christian life. They had received the Spirit. Did you receive it by works or faith? Did we receive the Spirit? Did we receive it by works or by faith? The Spirit filled us by faith. We reached out and received Him by faith and, and are filled with Him. We, uh, we have experienced our justification uh, by faith. These things have been given to us and they're by faith. Faith. Our faith, not our works. And so uh, the emphasis that just shall live by faith, he indicates to us. Uh, so have you received the Spirit by the works of the law? No. Verse 2, but by faith. Do you therefore begin in the Spirit? Do you want to wind up uh, perfecting it by the flesh? No. That's what they're wanting you to do. You've received the Lord and the supernatural blessings of God. You've been justified. And what has taken place is that they're wanting to tell you that you've got to bring along now a performance-based religion and start doing things out of simple obligation. These things are necessary. And Paul says, no, it's not the case. And then he begins in verse 15, he talks about the covenant we received. And this promise is by, our freedom that we have in Christ is by promise and not by law. In chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, uh, 15, all the way through 25, he will deal with this ideal about us uh, receiving uh, our liberty and our life in Christ by promise, not by law. And the emphasis here is upon Abraham. Now to Abraham his seed were the promise made. He said, not unto seeds, but as many, and to the seed which is Christ. Notice, that seed which he promised in the context, it's Isaiah. I mean, uh, uh, um, Isaac. But really, the seed that's there, given the promised son, doesn't necessarily speak of Isaac as much as it one seed, that of Christ. Of course, Christ comes from Isaac, uh, but the seed is the indication of Christ. But of the covenant which was confirmed before God in Christ, the law was 430 years later, does not make the promise unavoid. Uh, uh, well, what happened to Abraham? Did he receive what he received from God by works? In Romans chapter 4, he tells us that Abraham 
when God justified him by faith, he was uncircumcised. It was after that that he was circumcised. Therefore, our father Abraham was first a Gentile before he was a Jew by your standard. He was, he was received. And the work that he did, he was justified. And there afterwards he was circumcised. Circumcision supposed to be a testimony of your faith in God. That's what it was with Abraham. God saw his righteousness and he would confirm that to righteousness by faith, by circumcision. The promise was not done away with when the law came. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. That's true. Amen. There are those who suggest that the tithing is a part of the law. I'm sorry, my friend. That, well, I'm glad to tell you, my friend, that's really not the case. It may be sorry for some, but the uh, tithing was not instituted by the law. Tithing was instituted under the promise. Amen. Under the promise of grace. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Our priesthood is not the priesthood of the Levites. That's under the law. Our priest is under Melchizedek. And tithing was instituted under grace as a part of the promise. Matter of fact, under the law, there is no regula there's regulation for the, uh, for the tithing, but there's no consequences if you do not pay it. Notice, there are several things. If you worship other gods, uh, you can be executed. If you commit adultery, you can be executed. Executed. Nineteen reasons for execution. But there was no execution for not paying tithes. Why? The law would regulate it, but the law didn't institute it. Grace instituted it. And the Bible tells us that if you don't pay, God shuts the windows of heaven and uh, God will take care of it. Amen. You don't have to worry about it. You see, tithing is not a tax. The government taxes them. And, and he said, when your government, uh, king comes, he's going to tax you 20%. Civil authority taxes. But in the church, there's no such thing as tax. There's that free will giving. But God does say he would want 10. You know what? He could have told us 90%. He could have said, I, I want 90% and you live on 10%. God's being gracious to us. We shouldn't complain at all. God's being gracious to us. Uh, but anyway, these things established by the law. Uh, but the, the promise was long before the law. In other words, my liberty came not through the obedience of a law, but by faith in Christ Jesus of a promise that was established long before uh, 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 the law uh, through Moses. So where does our liberty come? Our liberty does not come through obedience to a law or works. It comes by faith in Him. And everything we receive, we have received by faith. It has come through promise, praise God, and not through law. And the third thing he talks about is that we're sons and not slaves. Sons and not slaves. And this is what he deals with beginning in verse 20, uh, 26 in chapter 3 all the way through chapter 4. He tells us that we're heirs of faith. He tells us that we're sons of God. He lets us know that as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor free male. For we're all one in Christ Jesus. And ye are Christ and you're Abraham's seed heirs according to the promise. Why? How can we be sons of the promise? Because the promise was given to Abraham by faith, and by faith I've received the same promise, praise God. And therefore I have become by promise and by faith Amen. the son and daughter of Abraham. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now he will give, uh, he will urge faithfulness and so forth, and it's not beyond me to uh, deal with those first part of chapter 4. But then he talks about again in the children of promise, for it's written in verse 22 of chapter uh, 4, that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Mm. They said, probably those fellows reading this, and when, or when Paul was teaching this, hey, you better not go there, because if you go there, we got you. Because we are from the free woman and we're not from the bond. He's going to stop. Paul is going to establish that Abraham has two sons. There is one from Ishmael and it's from uh, the bond slave uh, by works. And then there is one by faith and promise, Sarah with Isaac. 
And of course they'll say, we are from Isaac and we are freeborn. You'd think that would be the argument and they might have something with Paul. But when Paul finishes with the allegory, he first established and they will say, there are children from Mount Sinai and then there, 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 are, there are the children that are free. And yes, they are. And then he turns it on them. And he said, I want you to know those who are true children of Abraham are by faith. You Jews who say that you are the sons of Isaac are not really the sons of faith. Your mother is the bond slave. I mean, you talk about getting mad. I mean, they switched the whole thing around. They've been preaching all this time that through Isaac we are the sons of Abraham. And you're telling us that we're from uh, uh, Ishmael and the bond lady? How can you do that to us because your work is not by faith uh, it is by works your life is not lived in faith toward God but obedience to a law therefore you are of the children of the flesh but these Gentiles who have been outside the commonwealth have become a part of the family of God because just like Abraham they have put faith in God oh praise the Lord now that'll upset them and I guarantee you they're gnashing at their teeth. But he uses this allegory that they have used all the time and said what you state is true. But you need to understand that Isaac is a son not of the flesh but of promise. Sarah was going to help God out. And by works of flesh and God rejected it. Why? So it may be solely upon the faith of the promise of God. And Isaac was a son born out of, out of faith and a promise of God. And everyone who puts their faith in Him. And if you as uh, Jews by blood will talk about faith in Christ, you too can become a true child of Abraham. But if not, you are of the bond slave. You are not of the free woman. Mm. And the same replies today. How is it we being Gentiles can be compared a part of the, fa uh, the family of God? It is not through some kind of performance of religion. It is because we have put our faith in the atoning work of Christ. We have reached out and received everything through Christ that we might be His and His alone. How is this liberty applied then? Supplied in three ways. And beginning in chapter 5, he said, first, stand fast in your liberty. Persevere in the liberty. First thing you've got to do is to stand fast in your liberty. Let none of these bring a yoke upon you that you have to do that will take away your freedom. He speaks of circumcision. But today, if we're not very careful, when we get saved and, we, and we've experienced even being baptized, experienced workings of miracles in our presence, if we're not very careful, our emphasis in obedience and holiness can become a standard that you must obey and be an evidence of which uh, we get to heaven. And we turn away from our faith and our love toward God. He spoke to the church at Ephesus and said, I see your patience. I see your work. I see your labor. But I have someone against you because you have left your first love. It is possible to lose your faith, leave your faith in God and put your trust upon your performance. Amen. We can never transfer our faith to our performance. Amen. We can never look at our obedience as something to argue with God. We can never take our standards in prayer and say, God, this is the way I've done and this is what I've done. You owe this to me. Oh, that's a bad way to go, my friend. Why? Because now you, uh, you're you placing yourself under a law. Because I have obeyed. You are required to do this to me. You've taken yourself out and under a promise. You've taken yourself out and under faith. And you've placed yourself under performance. No performance will help. It makes no difference how good we may be or how upright we may live. Our obedience does not come from a performance. It comes by faith in Christ Jesus. We have put our trust in Him and our faith will exercise. Hallelujah. Faith works. Faith works. And if you have faith, it works. But you can substitute your faith for works. And therefore, 
the reading of the Bible, the praying of the prayer, making sure that we live according to our external holiness, making sure that we pay our tithes, making sure that we go to church. What happens? These become a testimony of our performance. And now we're doing pretty good. Instead of them being expressions of our love and faith toward God, they become expressions of our faithfulness toward Him. It's, it's, there's only one who is truly faithful. And God has been faithful unto us. Let every man be a liar. God does not deny Himself, but we deny ourselves. God will never deny who He is, but oftentimes we will deny the very things that God has done for us. And because we have been so instrumental and so consistent in our obedience toward the Lord, we turn away from our simple trust in Him and now depend upon what we're doing. Don't go that way. Stand fast in your liberty. Don't be in bondage to your religion. No matter what it may be, don't be bound by the things we do. Let our love express itself in devotion to Him. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, can you understand this? They get mad. Just like that couple did. Wasn't that a lovely wedding? My, my, my. Anyway. Couldn't happen to no better couples, you know. That little boy, Andrew, about four years old, came and told me, I'm going to marry Abby. <laughs> oh, a lot of us saw it. Some of us, are, well, some of us were willfully blind. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. When married, you get married. You get, you get, you get married. And it's all of an expression of love toward your spouse. And then she, she began to perform her duties as a burden and obligation. He begins to do the same. And he looks at her and says, I'll be faithful to you and I'll be a good husband to you, but my love for you is Dwayne. I don't love you. Like I used to. What happens to the relationship? All it does is become a performance. A keeping a front. There's no real love toward one another. It can be devastating. Devastating it can. That's the same thing with us. By faith we've received Jesus. We've found our liberty from the powers of sin. We've been addicted to the things that are wrong. We're now in a pure religion undefiled, expressing our faith in God. And what we need to do is maintain that faith and that relationship with Him in love and trust and never become bound by duty. We do it. I go to church because I have to. I read the Bible because I have to. I sing the songs because I have to. I know it's right and I'm going to do it because it's right, but my heart's not in it. You moved away from liberty and now you put yourself under bondage. That's not what God wants. He wants everything we do to be an expression of love toward Him. Yes. Right. The duties of a marriage can be a burden or a devotion, a duty or an express of devotion. And it all deals with attitude. It all deals with the commitment of the heart. And I want you to know, we need to be made very sure that no matter how old we come in Christ, that we will ever maintain the freshness of our first love. And that we will love Him and trust Him. That no matter how close we get to Him or how close He gets to us, we will not permit meant that familiarity to break us away from our commitment to them. It will not become a duty. It will not be something that we do as a method. It will be an expression of our devotion to Him. Hallelujah. Stand fast in your liberty. It is because holiness people have taken the standard of holiness and made it a duty instead of a devotion right. expressed. Right. That the world looks at us and says, you're hypocritical, you're legalistic, you're bound. And we say, I'm not bound, but we really are. 
and they see how we're bound to it. You don't think we're bound to it? A few years ago, 20 some years ago, Pentecostal owners church had decided, hey, we're not going to hold to this any longer. And what was it? They changed their teachings concerning how they are to live. And what happened? The old people who were doing it said, I didn't believe in it anyway and I'm glad that we're free. Our standard of holiness is not to become a burden and a yoke to bear. Come on now. And when we're preaching and we're preaching holiness and we're preaching sin, it's not that we can uh, uh, bring judgment and condemnation so much and that's a part of the law, but the fact that individuals can see that there is a freedom that comes in Christ Jesus. And with that, Paul, is, Paul knows that if you stand fast in this liberty, that there may be an occasion in which you could... Uh, uh, turn away from that which is proper. So he says in verse 13. Second way to apply it is that you are to serve in love. For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. Stand fast in your liberty. Stand, stand against performance-based religions. And duty that has to be performed because it's a job. But he said... But make no occasion to use your liberty to serving the flesh. A lot of that way. I'm free. I'm free in Christ, so I can do this. He said, "Your freedom in Christ does not give you the freedom to do what is wrong. It gives you the freedom to do what is right." Just because you have the opportunity and the power to do it does not make it right. Liberty comes that enables us to fulfill our responsibilities, to serve one another. Our liberty is not to indulge ourselves in the flesh. Our liberty is to indulge ourselves in serving one another. Oh, glory. Liberty is given so that we may serve and be who we are. I am set free from sin, not to indulge in sin or selfish purposes, but that I may serve one another in love. The third thing... He mentions his walk in the Spirit. And this will do the remainder of chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, all the way through 16. Third thing, walk in the Spirit. He said, don't bite and devour one another. Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Because you see, because they have heard this ideal of you have to be circumcised and are not, they're about to move from their liberty, it's going to bring all kinds of problems. You're not serving as you are to serve in love. There is devouring one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. First problem he makes mention is that there's war against the flesh and the Spirit. True with these uh, saints here is because they've been listening now to these Judaizers. It's bringing all kind of confusion and it's bringing up kind of desires of living in that world that you used to. If I'm circumcised, and that's what it's cried, and I'm circumcised, then I can do anything I want to do. And uh, be it. it's, it's, it's like that doctrine, once saved, always saved. If you, if you believe that, you, you can serve the Lord. I mean, you're, you're saved no matter what you do. You know what that will do to you, don't you? It will cause you to be involved in sin. Yes, yes. Paul says, not only are you stand fast in your liberty, not only are you to serve one another in the Lord, you're to walk in the Spirit. The Spirit was contrary to the flesh and the flesh contrary to these. He's not talking about a perpetual uh, battle here. He's talking about the situation that exists there among them. And he says, what you need to do is you need to crucify the flesh. You need to crucify the flesh. We're not going to live in peaceful coexistence with the world. We're going to crucify the flesh and crucify our flesh, I mean ourselves, to the world. So here it is. In the works of the flesh, 16, through the Spirit. And some suggest one, that uh, fruit can be plural though it be not uh, pl- uh, uh, fruits. Fruits is plural, but fruit can be plural as well. Because if I bring you a bowl of fruit, there's different kinds of fruits in it, but I don't say I bring you a bowl of fruits. I bring you a bowl of fruit. So this word here, fruit, can be singular and plural. Some suggest it is referring to love, and the other eight is expressions of love. Or it could be referring to all of them as fruit, and like a bringing to this. So, Whichever you want, okay, you just can't get away from saying it's just love because it's singular. It could be plural. So here he brings to us a cluster of fruit, answering to us that this is love, joy, and peace. These things are to be expressed in love. 
And if we crucify the flesh, this is what we will do. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. And then in chapter 6, having established this before he gets there, let us not be zealous, uh, desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. Before he makes application of this fruit, once the flesh is crucified, once you have crucified the flesh and you allow yourself to live in the Spirit and walk in Him, there's something that you need to guard. You need to guard no vain glory. Let no one, let us not be desirous of vain glory. The problems that comes in the church, the problems we have in relationship, is that somebody wants to control somebody else. Vain glory. I want to be important. I want to be recognized. I want to be somebody. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Because when you put yourself in the place of where I need to be recognized, I need to know something, I've got this and that. When you're emphasizing what does it does, it provokes some people. It provokes some people uh, against you. And then you become envious of others who are not like you. That's the problem with individuals who are full of self-interest. This will take us all the way back to chapter 2 of Galatians where it says that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If self is really dead, you won't have to worry about desiring vain glory. You'll not want simply a first place and doing all. Why? Because self-interest is destroyed. Now please understand that these crucifixions are not physical. They are moral. And that being the case that you can be tempted to raise up the old man. You can be tempted uh, to live in an arrogance of pride or be tempted to pride or a spirit of importance. These temptations come to us. But we must acknowledge self is dead. And I'm not going to raise up that selfish life that I lived before. I'm not going to raise it up. I'm going to keep it dead. And I'm not going to allow my body to desire things that it should be. I put it to death. I'm going to keep it to death. And that's what we need. Because if there's any vain glory coming in us, the reaction is going to be two. Number one, there are going to be people who are going to be provoked against us. And then there will be those that we will envy and tear down and criticize in order to make ourselves important. That's what vainglory does. What we knew, away with it. Let's sow to the Spirit. Let's live as God wants us to live. There is fruit, not flesh. And the self has been destroyed. And the life we're living, we're living by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us. With that admonition, he becomes down the practical application of the fruit. Oftentimes when we speak of fruit, we talk about it individually. But this is a cooperative, uh, a corporate sense. He speaks of the church, and the church should have the fruit of the Spirit. Sad it is that Pentecostal people emphasize gifts over fruit in some areas. And many times those who are not Pentecostal will emphasize fruit to the neglect of the gifts. Would to God he would give us churches. Would the WPC would be a church that would emphasize gifts and fruit. And that in the presence of the fruit, the gift will be operated. That's what we need. We don't need one against the other. We need the fruit that will determine our character and conduct. And we need the gift that will ensure our ministry to this world. Let's be what we ought to be and let's do what we're supposed to do. Hallelujah. By His fruit we will be. By His gifts we will do. And that's what we need. Both of them working in us. And the problem that we have is the vain glory that comes. Let every one of us humble ourselves. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We have preachers who ascend to the pulpit, arrogant, and I'm going to preach a better sermon than they are. I'll blister them. I'll do this one. All in vain glory. We have those who come to sing, showing off their talent, and I'll sing better than them. I'll move the congregation. And then you got other people who sing. I hope I can move the congregation. Get your eyes off the congregation and put your face and eyes on the Lord. Sing to the glory of God and let God use you. Amen. Rid of the vain glory. No arrogance. No pride. We're not going to provoke or be envious. And then he gives practical illustrations of how these are... Now, love. First thing, you find a father and fault. You who are spiritual. Those of you who have the Spirit. 
A spiritual person is a person who has the spirit. To those of you who are spiritual, have the spirit. Restore such a one spirit of meekness. Notice. Fruit of the spirit is meekness. You already said that. Meekness. Notice how the fruit of the spirit will work. The spirit will work when in correcting an individual who needs to be corrected and restored. It will be in a spirit of meekness. And then he tells us, considering yourself, lest ye be tempted. Here's the fruit of temperance. Spirit of temperance. So, and then he makes mention about bear one another's burden and so fruitful, fulfill the law of God. In this passage, there is bear ye one another's burdens. There is love and there is goodness to fruit is seen. If any man himself, uh, if any think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. And now in verse 3, he goes back to his first admonition in verse 26. Uh, Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Even when you're doing these things, even as you're bearing the burdens, even as you're showing love, even as you are ministering meekness and you're doing proper correction or discipline, do not think yourself to be something when you're nothing and you deceive yourself. Make sure that when you are performing your deeds, that you're not elevating yourself. Let every man prove his own work. Now the joy will come. The rejoicing and so forth. You can joy and rejoice in the Lord. In other words, he's telling us how that this fruit of the Spirit is. And he will use a term for it. Let him that be taught in good uh, of the Word. Let him uh, that teaches all good things. You know. Let him give, uh, communicate to those that teach him good things. Here again is the work of goodness. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Man sow, that shall he also reap. And then he tells us to sow to the Spirit. He's given us examples now of what it is to sow. You are to walk in the Spirit, number one. If we live in the Spirit, we're to walk. Put to death the flesh so that the fruit of the Spirit may live in you. Don't be desirous of vain glory because self is dead. And what do we need to do? We need to sow to the Spirit. Fruit, will, uh, fruit is there, but we need to sow to it. There'll be a time when you can express love. Express love. There'll be a time when meekness is required. Express the meekness. There's a time when you're going to be patient. Don't go around saying, I'm an unpatient man and I can't tell you. Exercise patience. We need to sow to the Spirit. We talk a lot about walking in the Spirit, but there's an attitude. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we got to sow to the Spirit. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit, evident in our lives, because he's there. He should be sold to. Opportunities will come for goodness. Sow the goodness. Opportunity will come for discipline. Uh, uh, allow yourself to be full of self-control. There will come occasions where the fruit of the Spirit needs to be manifest. Let's not raise up the old man and the previous life. That's dead. And the flesh is dead. I'm not going to live in that kind of life. I'm going to live the way God wants me. I want the fruit of the Spirit to be evident in in my life, I'm going to sow to the Spirit. Right. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Let every one of you do good unto all men, especially to those with a household of faith. And then he turns, and the last thing he says is, liberty is to be encouraged. Why? As many desire to have a fair show in the flesh, he goes back now to verse 26, don't be... Let's not be desirous of vain glory. As many as desire to be make, make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The reason why they really want you to be circumcised is because they don't want to be persecuted. So they're going to get you to go where they are so that they won't be so different. Why are people moving us away or wanting to move us away from holiness and so forth, so that they don't get the stench and the, or the reproach or the disdain from the world. If in some way they can get us to where they're going, then guess what? I, I got it saved. Yeah. Their, pu their purpose is not for your betterment. It is for their own vain glory. Yeah. Let us be encouraged. For these, they, they, they themselves were circumcised. They don't keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Look what I did. I got these Gentiles to become a part of us. All a sense of vain glory. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ by whom the world is crucified. Let us not be like that. Let us be encouraged. 
Let's be encouraged that the individuals who are trying to lead us in a, in a better way is not a better way, taking us away from Him. Let us be encouraged, praise the Lord, because the cross, the cross is crucified. Well, it's under the world. Third crucifixion. We're dead to the world, praise the Lord. Dead to self, dead to flesh, and dead to the world. That's what the cross does. People take the cross out of the church. They don't want the symbol. They don't want it anymore because it is a reproach to the world. Unless you wish to use it simply as an ornament to wear as, as jewelry. Other than that, you know, if you emphasize it or teach it, no, sir. It is the most icon in the world is the cross. And, and people are wanting to move it down, uh, away from us. But I want you to know the cross is not something that adores you. It is a symbol of humiliation. It is a symbol of death. It is a symbol of rejection. And we need to be able, Paul says, I glory in the cross. Oh, glory. Let us be encouraged because through that Christ, cross, uh, Jesus experienced uh, the curse for us that we could be set free. I will glory in the cross. Why? Because the world is crucified unto me. Why? Because they do not see Jesus as He really is. He died to redeem me from my sin. I will glory in the cross because there in the cross self was put to death. There in the cross flesh was put to death. There in the cross the world was crucified unto me. We need to glory in it. Take encouragement. If Christ was crucified, let us too bear the reproach. Let us too be crucified with Him. Let us know that Christ was willing to bear the shame and the reproach to set us free. Let's not uh, remove the reproach. Let us gladly embrace it. Paul says, leave me alone. I bear in my body the marks of Christ Jesus. Let us be encouraged if persecution comes let it be not because of an evil doer, but because we are Christian, because we follow after Christ. If the dark hours come, let us know that Christ is first with us. He that is with us is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Liberty that we have in Christ. Let us stand, please. We have an ever temptation, ever present temptation to perform our religion as a duty and as an obligation. You go there. You go there. You fall from grace. Because now the only way you can sustain yourself is make sure that you live strict. And others who do it will go beyond the Scriptures themselves and requiring people to do things that are not even biblical in order to maintain their holiness. And then they'll do all kinds of things in order to make sure that their singing moves and motivates the people. Or the preachers, because he's skillful in manipulation, will use the pulpit to manipulate the people to get what they want. Why? Because they have fallen from grace. And the only thing that can satisfy them is the glory they get in their performance. Let's move away from performance Amen. as a duty and let it be an expression of our love. Amen. After 45 years, if my wife was to come and says, I've been your wife for 45 years, not because I love you, but because it was my duty, it would crush me. It would crush me. Let's not be doing our duty to the Lord because it's an obligation. Let us do it because it's an expression of our thankfulness, of our hope, and of our trust in Him. Amen. Let us pray, please. Lord, I thank You this morning. Help us to stand fast in our...